Welcome to today's artist talk for the show Aesthetics of Loss, showing at the Ukrainian Institute of Modern Art from February 18th to April 16th, 2023. Uh, with us uh, today are uh, the participating artists, including Ebti, Cassidy Early, Brianna Hernandez, Linda Marcus, Jessica Munich Ganger, Nirmal Raja, and Anders Zanichkowski. The Ukrainian Institute of Modern Art is proud to present Aesthetics of Loss, a collection of work by seven artists who have experienced loss of family members recently. Their studios became places for grieving and understanding the sudden vacuum of losing loved ones, either suddenly or over a long period of illness. Caregiving, memory, helplessness, loss, and the ultimate mystery of death are explored through painting, printmaking, fiber, ceramics, photography, installation, and video. Some artists utilize objects and clothing left behind by their loved ones and transform them into artworks, and some use ritual and natural materials as memorial or commemorative actions of grieving and coming to terms. Linda and uh, Nirmal, I was wondering if you could speak to how the show came about, how you kind of selected works, how you got in touch with each other as a group. Two years ago in January, my father passed away very suddenly and I could not be there to say goodbye. Uh, it was just so, um, such a shock. Um, and my work often is a response to what is going on around me. And so it's bound to impact the practice. In the meantime, I'm also looking at other um, friends and other artists to see uh, what I can learn from them. And this has been a pattern throughout my life. Linda and Jessica have also lost loved ones and uh, we are good friends and we have been walking and getting together, um, supporting each other in many ways. And so uh, our conversations often uh, drifted to how each of us coped with the losses in our lives. Uh, and all of us, our artists and makers. Um, and I was also seeing what was happening with the larger community. And I don't know exactly how it became an exhibition per se, but it just seemed like an organic growth out of this um, conversations and also this urge to learn how other artists are dealing with similar situations. We, I think, all of us kind of suggested other artists to look at. And um, Anders, I met through um, the Oxbow virtual residency. Uh, Epthi was recommended by a mutual friend of ours. Uh, Brianna used to live in Milwaukee and now has moved away. We really miss her. <laughs> we ran in, uh, into overlapping uh, subject matter. We started meeting uh, virtually to speak about how our practice and uh, uh, grief intersected, um, became a virtual support group of sorts, um, and eventually led to putting together proposals. Um, Linda, do you want to take over? The inspiration for curating the show really came about from the space itself. The museum has this beautiful undulating wall, and I thought it was a perfect place for Cassidy Early's uh, work. They place their work on um, yellow pieces of paper from yellow pads, and that became such a great backdrop for the work, and that kind of led into Brianna's work um, that looks at green burials and also um, uh, natural materials uh, to to sig signify kind of um, the urns and what happens with that. And that kind of leads the viewer to walk around the museum in a way and kind of leads them in a direction and looking at the different materials that each artist used and 
um, how they interpreted those materials as they work their way through grief. Thank you. Um, you know, caregiving has, has come up quite a bit in um, our conversations about the show and even in your own uh, statements. And I wonder, um, you know, what are your thoughts about that? Would you, would you say that kind of the process and even the, you know, the objects that you made are um, maybe in some ways also an act of caregiving? Does anyone want to jump in on that? What are your thoughts? Yeah, no, it's interesting. The exact way you phrased it is how I feel. Um, one of my series, it's not on display, but um, is Utides Curativos, which is focusing on medical equipment used in home caregiving. And I found that when I was gilding these objects, these like plastic, cheap, throwaway objects with silver and gold and copper, I felt like I was taking care of them the way that they helped me to take care of my mother and that it was like transferring that energy because as was mentioned earlier there tends to be this vacuum of everything that was just kind of sucking into a black hole and so um finding myself after my mother had passed being like what do I do with all this care energy that it still feels like it needs to go somewhere I keep walking and thinking, oh, it's time for medication, but it's not. Um, so I really did find myself applying um, these materials to these objects in a very caregiver sensibility um, to really show how important that act was, but also to give a direction for that energy to go in. You mentioned, um, and so you didn't use the word, but okay, this idea of repetition, you know, where you're... Um, when you're caring for someone and that there's this kind of routine uh, that develops, like when they need their medicine, it tends to be something within a, you know, it, medicine is one of those things that, you know, it's two, two o'clock, six o'clock kind of thing. You know, there's, there's kind of a precise time frame um, to it. And, you know, sometimes I think of um, um, art making and practice and, you know, particularly maybe fiber work, even that there's this kind of repetition about it. And, um, I wonder is that maybe help process the grief, you know, I think also Anders, for example, in your, you know, your burial, uh, blankets, that there's movement itself, um, and how your body is kind of engaged in, in the making of it. Does that, how does that relate to the grief process? Weaving is the most repetitive craft that I've ever done. Um, and I, I came to it as a printmaker. Um, so, so I would say very repetitive. <laughs> um, and I think a lot about how as a weaver, uh, when I sit at the loom and I'm throwing the shuttle and I'm pulling the beater and my feet are working the treadles, um, the loom kind of becomes an extension of my own consciousness and an extension of my own body as though I'm operating one of those like one man band contraptions. And the, the, the product is cloth and not sound, but it feels very similar. And there's a, a coordination that happens that is, in my experience, a heightened or a more elaborate experience of a lot of the repetition in other daily labor, like washing the dishes, folding the laundry, bathing someone, bathing your, you know, all these like personal care, home care, cooking, cleaning, taking out the trash, you know, and weaving cloth at a loom brings me very much to that state, which is related also to the, the other piece in the show, I am trying to think about you. Um, which was a performance I did where I washed this 1900 square foot gallery floor in preparation for this memorial performance when I first was making the work. Um, and the title comes from, I often use performances as a way to have thoughts or have conversations I couldn't have otherwise. And in that case, with um, the piece that's documented for the show at UIMA, I wanted to like uh, give myself an intentional experience of what can happen when your mind sort of floats free a little bit while your hands are busy and you're able to contemplate sometimes really heavy things 
or really deeply personal things or things that you feel stuck in or unresolved in, like a lot of things that come up with grief. And and it, it, by keeping your body busy with these materials, you can have a, a different experience of your own consciousness around something very heavy. Um, and so I washed the floor thinking I'm going to give myself a chance to really like lean into that experience. Um, and weaving absolutely gives me that same experience. That's so interesting. And, and I'm not surprised by your answer, actually. For me, since my father passed away so suddenly, it's not what you think is the typical caregiving, but caring for his memory and for his legacy, the stuff of life that we often leave behind after we're gone, what do you do with all that stuff? And how do you hold on to those stories, those impressions, the imprints of someone's life on others like so you know a lot of it came in the form of a memorial book of photographs and writings by my dad but also memorializing items that are that he left behind and that seems to be an act of care because otherwise it's just gone and it, we're just obliterated from the face of the earth overnight and there's nothing I don't know it, it seems like they felt the need to hold on to these things and also caring for my mother it came in that form the needs of family members who are grieving even more than me so how does how does that fit into everything now and it's something that I've been I'm still st struggling with two years down the road I understand thank you thank you I'd like to move on with some other questions Epti how does recreating or envisioning interior settings in your works of uh, photos printed on fabric achieve quote a memory that is less of the past and more of the future end quote, as you said. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's, um, my work is very process heavy and it's like a lot of things come together. The fabric in itself started because, okay, let me, I started grad school and my dad died three weeks after I started grad school. And I went into grad school with a work that is mainly photographic work. And I feel like Photography is tricky because it has these implications of like nowness or like, you know, it's like documentary photography. Anyway, it's a whole conversation, fine arts and photography. And I never worked this way before my dad. And especially after my dad, I think I I had to stop and start over. And the photographs that I came into grad school with ended up being printed on fabric as I was trying to kind of deal with what was going on and also follow in my family's tradition of being tailors. My uh, older uncles moved the whole family from a small village in the Nile Delta to Cairo um, to, you know, to move to the big city and work. So I grew up around fabric and we all lived in the same building. So my uncles had their atelier downstairs. Um, so the fabric, right? So photography, fabric comes together, becomes in fabric. I start writing about my pieces and I start thinking about the way I work in that I am building an archive that I keep going back to. So photography usually moves forward. And when it moves backwards, it's just thinking about memory. And then we have a whole conversation about how memory is deceptive and how the frame leaves out stuff as much as it puts in stuff. So, but I also don't work this way. So I think it was the attempt of thinking about building an, an, an ongoing archive that I keep going back to. So it's not about creating a memory as much as it's like telling stories, I guess, is what it comes down to and thinking about photography as an as an archive of a story, um, not the photograph itself and what it represents, but more everything else that you can read in it. And I'm still figuring out some of that as I'm as I'm going. But that's, you know, it, it, it in a nutshell, it's never a straight answer with me. It's always like <laughs> five things coming together at the same time. Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't know that you, there is a straight answer. You know, grief and memory and loss. It's, a, I think, it has a lot of different shapes and it morphs and changes over time because we have, we live in the present and we have, you know, present day experiences that remind us of that person or a situation or something like that. But I'm wondering, do you, what kind of stories 
do you associate with those photographs? And let's say if you're um, your dad sitting in the chair, what what do you remember? Yeah, I mean, I as someone who I've, I'm originally from Egypt and I've lived in the States for 11 years this year, which is a long time. And I'm thinking about, you know, stories surviving. My Both my parents are dead at this point. And I feel like they keep on living, you know, as long as I'm telling their stories. And I think my answer to your question specifically will also kind of go back to the caregiving question because I have been thinking of an artist as a caregiver to the audience, not just us towards our people. But I think that um, I got introduced here in, uh, in the Bay to uh, Ashara Ikundayu, who is this amazing creator and writer and artist. And she wrote this book called Artist as a First Responder. Mm -hmm. And she talked to us about it in 2019, before the pandemic, I was in grad school. And I remember that this stuck with me. I mean, now I know her and we meet, and but it stuck with me, this idea of artists as the first responder who organizes when catastrophe happens. Oftentimes it is artists. And I think that giving space, I've, what I've seen in the past three, four years, my dad is getting on four years this coming September. September, uh, his passing, people just, you, they see your work and then they have space to feel their own feelings. And I feel like my dad sitting in his, his chair, this being, you know, like no one, you know, whatever, this is a man sitting in a chair. They can, you know, that's all everyone sees. It doesn't matter if he's my dad, he can be any man. And, but like this cut of picture and, you know, like how it's put back together with like the layers of the chair being there twice. I've seen how people react to it and it was reassuring to me as much as I struggled in grad school making work around death because everyone gets so nervous and tense and they're like they don't know what to say and you know that and then you go out in the world and show the work and then people come and say thank you for that you know because they can just spend time with it as I imagine with all other pieces in the show as I you know sat with them and look at their picture and talk to some people I think this is what this is about that you also give space to people who don't have language or ways to talk about death or process their own loss but then they look at this art and then for one second for five seconds however time they take with the piece they feel this thing where it's kind of um they're being taken care of and their feelings so that's also a lot on my on my mind because i do like you know we all say the person is political but it is really because it is what we go through is so not unique. We all go through it and it's a common, you know, experience and that's, it's, you know, whatever, everyone dies and still we struggle in talking about it and still we struggle in, you know, being vulnerable and being sad and showing that in whatever way that may be the most subtle to the most extreme ways. So I guess it's, again, it's like a lot of things coming together for me as I, as I do that, yeah. You know, certainly the response in the gallery among visitors has been kind of gentle, um, I don't know, if I, maybe warmth or just this kind of care. It has been caring, you know, sympathy, empathy. Uh, visitors spend a lot of time in the exhibit, actually. They really think or feel or they, it's not an exhibit where you kind of come in and leave, you know, the, I think one of, of an old um, kind of statistic generated certainly among uh art historians you know concerned about their their uh students how much they were listening or how much time they spent in a museum and this is my a little bit of my background um was that most people only spent you know like 15 seconds in front of an image and then they would go to the next one and um you know i'm i'm seeing 15 minutes in front of the works and it's um it's nice very nice. So I think your your intention is validated in in how uh, visitors are experiencing uh, the work. That makes me so happy. And I just also wanted to bring up how when I joined this group of artists who had already kind of uh, Nirmal and Linda with the idea of the show, and we had our first meeting, and it felt so supportive. And I've never been in a show that is ex exclusively about death and. Hearing that is honestly is everything because the, you know we've been through so much and it's so hard. And again, I'm everyone have 
met you know different challenges in how they move through the world and the relationships suffering from the loss that they've been through and all the things and I feel like hearing that is yeah it's it's, it's extremely comforting that this is actually working and it is of use to other people. Mm -hmm. Good. Brianna, I was wondering if you can speak to some of the paired education resources and workshops in your series. Absolutely. Um, so I um, realized early on that when I was making the really raw, reactive work about my own grief that I wanted to have something that people could do on their own as a, like a takeaway. I didn't want to bring up a bunch of feelings for other people and then just leave them hanging. So I started just very, um, where I was, I, I started offering workshops that were with each show that gave people a chance to think about grief either in the abstract if they hadn't experienced it or literally <laughs> if they had. And that was really um, based on my the process that I have in the studio of starting with something super basic, like just drawing, getting yourself into the movement and asking yourself questions to think more deeply about what do these things mean to me. But as I kept going, I was um, thinking about all the things that I wish I would have known going into my experience and collecting resources, researching, trying to find other ways that maybe things could have been. <laughs> and so I started gathering those things in, in lists and in links and showing them to people as part of these workshops. Like, hey, here's something you can take away that you can either have this really critical conversation um, on your own with family members, or maybe looking for support. And here's a list of things that you can turn to when you walk away from here. And that led me to um, learning about death doulas through a book I was reading on caregiving. And so I decided to take this course. I was like, why not? I'll just see what it's like. So I started incorporating that as well. Um, not only how can people have a workshop to think about their own grief, but workshops to think about one's own end of life planning and how that is really hand in hand with the experience of grieving when you think about how much time and space is taken away from honoring your feelings when you're pulled to the side with paperwork and bills and calling people and trying to coordinate things. So I really wanted to find ways for people to access that in a safe way. So I normally do different themes depending on the group, whether it's kids or adults or whether we're talking about um, advanced planning versus talking about, um, you know, just this is how I feel right now as a griever, but really trying to use art and people actively making art as a way to talk about those things and think about how what it means to them um, after I opened up the conversation by sharing my own vulnerable experience. So it really ranges, but I've I've noticed that um, you know, similar to the comments earlier, at first there's this hesitancy, like what you want to have a workshop about what? And then when we do it, everybody leaves being like, Thank you so much, because I didn't even know that I needed to think about this aspect of it until we started going down these prompts and until I heard someone next to me say that this is how they like experienced it. So it's really been a huge part of not only, you know, these individual event based workshops that are with the shows, but also the resources that are built into what someone is seeing. So if I'm making a piece um that is specifically derived from an aspect of let's say advanced planning i'll think about what are the industry components that go into that that i can weave in as an educational aspect of the work in your akida skansamo series the use of natural materials such as moss and salt are employed is this a notion of life cycle those past loved ones reconnecting or re, uh, being brought back to earth? Yeah, I mean, there's layers to it for me. Um, 
there's the the very literal like this will decompose um or in some versions of it where there's been living plants as opposed to dried out moss or something like that um the they will you know fade as they do in the winter and then bloom again in the spring um but it's also thinking about um how we can find alternatives to the very harsh uh, measures involved in conventional burial practices. Um, a lot of times people don't even realize because they're, again, they're overwhelmed, they're grieving, they're just going with the, you know, the path of least resistance that's been laid out. So maybe they don't think, oh, this whole thing is made out of fiberglass or, oh, do I really need like, this concrete block around so that the grass stays even like you know um so both both thinking about the literal life cycle that natural materials have but also uh, trying to bring up the topic of green burial options in a way that's not just um hey like you're horrible for <laughs> you know putting chemicals in the ground but instead hey look at how beautiful this can be you know, it's there's not one way to show how special and loved someone is. Like you can do it in different mediums, and it'll still have the same significance, even without these conventions that we're just told. Oh, this is what you do when you really love someone. You pay five thousand dollars for the, this fiberglass uh, coffin. You know, so trying to look at those options as well. Um, but then I also like to layer in. The materials that I choose have certain meaning behind them for me, because this is my example that is a invitation for people to think of their own. Um, it's not the only one that exists. It's just this is my one example, and some of those materials hold a personal cultural significance for me when I think about like the offerings that I lay out on my altar, or when I think about um, things that meant a lot to the people that I'm honoring specifically. So there's a lot of layers in it for me, but I do think that that material can kind of <laughs> uh, it's pull you in a little bit so that you can start thinking of those things. Thank you. Linda, I'd like to ask you something. Um, can you elaborate on your photography process? of sewing into the negative before exposure, or I should say rather onto the negative before exposure. Yeah, thank you so much. That, honestly, when I think about working in that way, so one of the pieces that's in the show is a photograph that is a child's life vest. And the way it was photographed was I sewed in the dark onto an unexposed negative and then exposed it. And for me, the process of sewing onto this negative and doing it in the dark was very cathartic in a way, because as we go down this journey of loss and grief and death, we don't know where we're going. We don't know the right way. We're just kind of you know, feeling our way through these, through this experience. And also at the same time, the, you know, so there's the making of it. So it's almost like a performance in, in making the piece. And then there's the printing of it. And what ends up happening is that it creates kind of a portal looking hole in the negative. And so you have light coming into the photograph, um, that that you wouldn't ha normally have in a regular exposure and it's kind of looking at portals thinking about what's beyond i like to believe that my mom and my sister who i lost six months apart that they they are with me every day there there's some there's something there and that i just can't see it and it's just a portal into my understanding of of where they might be and their essence and feeling their essence and so that was my way of articulating that and then by the same token taking a photograph of this actually the life vest was something that came up out of Lake Michigan after a really horrible storm. And so I thought it was really appropriate to use this life vest that ended up on the, you know, the beaches of Lake Michigan as a, you know, a remnant of a 
terrible, terrible, horrible storm. And I thought that's very much apropos for what I was feeling like I was going through, kind of pushed into this crazy, I don't know where I am. Am I up? Am I down? What am I doing? Kind of feeling when you're trying to care give for someone and then you eventually lose them. Thank you. Nirmal, how did you decide that your father's clothing, quote unquote, fit as the vehicle or object to articulate his loss and your grief? We're often left with all the things that we have to do after a person passes and going through my dad's closet and uh, all his paperwork was a big part of my three months in India after he passed. I think clothing especially is very meaningful because it's gifted or made to tailored for that body or for that person. It's based on their liking, but it's also a second skin that protects our bodies. Uh, so it's impossible to disassociate uh, garments with the body. And witnessing my dad's um, cremation was really transformative for me. Um, Funerals in general are tough, but in India, it's very, very direct and visceral experience because it is not this removed, removed thing that in the West where you go, it's everything's composed and embalmed and put in the casket. And you, sometimes you don't even see the person, but everything is very direct in funerals in India. And uh, it was just so shocking to see my dad's body uh, become an object, um, basically. So and it's, it became that, that that association with the garment and the body is, is similar in that way because our bodies are essentially houses, garments for our souls. So that's how those two things came together. And I needed to use a process that involved fire because of the association with the, with the cremation. And so I worked with Michael Ware, who teaches uh, ceramics at UWM, and asked him if he would help me dip my dad's clothing in a uh, ceramic slip and glaze them and fire them. So that's how those two things came together. Because in a way, it was another, another letting go, because the materials of the fabric gets burnt away. So just like his his body. So I, I didn't have anything to hold on to. It was just like willfully letting go. So it was a, it was another way of grieving. It became a ritual uh, while also ending up with an artwork that recorded, recorded something that got to that feeling of my dad was with me. Uh, he was a huge influence on me. And he's in my DNA, but at the same time, he's not here. So how do I get to those two opposing feelings of him being there and not being there at the same time? Of course. And then I imagine, um, you know, you have the objects now, which are kind of, you, you can always have them, you know, and they're here with you in the United States. And it, it's something you've you've taken with you overseas, yeah. in a way. Jessica, uh, who are some of the spirited lives you pay tribute to in your works? I find a sense of familiarity, not necessarily dreamlike or lived or recognizable experiences, but somewhere in between in some of your works, specifically Washington Park and Lincoln Village. Is that something you aim to achieve? Thank you, Adrian, for your question. And I just want to, you know, I appreciate that you described your sense of familiarity with the pieces. Um, I did not, I'm delighted that you connect with them in this way. I never know how people are going to connect um, with the work as we use our experiences as points of comparison when seeing something new or for me, experiencing something new um, and experiencing the tremendous loss over the past three years. I certainly realize this when I travel, when I volunteer, and when I approach some a, a new situation that I don't quite have the, the right skills to cope. Um, my collage-based approach includes an assemblage of textures from literally hundreds of sketches and prints. They serve as documentation of community engagement and relationships. 
Sketches include architectural elements, sites, detrius, and objects from individual sites, as well as the larger landscape, which are used to form structures and architectures that serve as uh, community portraits. And when I say that community portraits is they do document uh, space and time. And for instance, I'll have hundreds of sketches from a day of volunteering or hundreds of sketches from a walk uh, from one point in a neighborhood to another point in a neighborhood. And along the way, I'm sketching architecture and people and dogs and children at play. And then I end up having uh, transfer those sketches to screen prints and print them hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times and then reconstruct them into the architecture. Oftentimes I've led friends and students uh, along walks and we will look at the architecture and we can identify from the face of a home or a building, what stories do they tell? Like how are people making decisions within the paint color that they choose or uh, decorations in, in their lawn or also shows um, maybe time of residency or uh, and sometimes neglect of uh, or inability to maintain a residency. Oftentimes I've, when I do this community-based work, I tend to highlight or create portraits of um, sites and buildings of teachers or mentors or masters or, uh, you know, treasures within the community as an, an honor to them. It's such a wonderful gift to give them uh, a collage of that's based on um, their home or their workplace. And I just, you know, when I talk about their spirited lives, just it's a, it, I'm not documenting the actual activity, but maybe the essence of the activity and the essence of the the people who are working in those spaces. So I've been doing that for years and it actually, without knowing, it helped me come up with ways to navigate and archive uh, my father's space and then my mother's space, you know, after their passing. So I use that same technique of, of sketching, of um, charting their territory, whether it's their studio or bedroom or attic space, um, going through and, and mindfully rendering all of those objects. Um, as Linda was talking about having boxes and boxes uh, from an estate, um, I can draw them and then I have them forever, even though, you know, I'm taking multiple trips to Goodwill or um, giving a lot of objects away to other family members and thinking, oh, I wish I would have kept that. Well, I can. Um, I can also process it by printing it a lot, a lot, a lot of times. And it's like taking notes when you're listening to a lecture. It helps you become active in, in listening and learning and remembering. And then beyond that activity, you never forget. Like it, that for me, I mean, I, maybe that's just like my learning style. I never go back and refer to my notes necessarily, but the, the actual act of um, drawing or writing um, just really makes an impression in me. But then I also have this artifact or artwork in the end, uh, whether I keep it or whether it's sold or whether it shows, um, that's, I, you know, it's a beautiful tool to connect with other people. And I think as artists, um, that's a real great gift of communication that we have. Uh, but it, I don't need to own that or keep it because it's the activity of, of creating it and that meditation and that reflection um, and that way to process that that means everything to me. Uh, the work in the exhibition called Fragile Thanks, uh, my dad wrote Fragile Thanks and on paper plates and hung them everywhere <laughs> around the house because he worked in ceramics. That series is, um, they're paper plates that I found as sketchbooks that I found in his studio. He had stacks and stacks of paper plates all over. Um, it, it was a practical uh, measure as he would make hot dogs in the microwave every night and then take them to his ceramic studio. And then, you know, there would be a couple extra paper plates on the bottom and then he would use them as sketch paper. And so I wanted to capture that quirk <laughs> in his practice by making this dedication to him and his sketchbook pages, which include notes, quotes, show titles, um, friends' phone numbers, <laughs> and glaze mixtures. I loved reflecting on that after uh, after he passed. And um, I just think it's such, those who know him or those who don't know him that can read that um, can get a little glimpse of his world, his spirited world. And it gave me a chance to spend more time with those objects and not have to actually keep the, the actual objects, even though those are paper plate ephemera. That's all right. I think in conclusion, joining this group and preparing work for this show uh, is real point of pride. I feel, you know, honored just 
like I said, a lot of pride in this accomplishment during a time where everything was kind of the upheaval of maintaining a department as a department co-chair at school, teaching full time, um, driving to Indiana on a weekly basis, then bringing my mother home um, to to Milwaukee. Um, just all of it was just uh, so chaotic and creating the work for the show gave me a tangible goal. Um, and it also gave me a space to talk with, you know, Normal and Linda along the, the journey. And as we were kind of processing uh, our grief and actually transforming the grief into our art, uh, you know, it, it just was such uh, an, an amazing and I just have so much, feel so much privilege in being able to have that as uh, as a strategy to kind of navigate loss. And I just, I also feel as Anders was talking about how we all felt in the the gallery space, we could have the joy of installation, but then there were moments of, you know, tears and comfort and then ordering pizza. Like it's just, it's real. And I just, I really hope that, and also as evidence, the reception, you know, just people can have the space to like freely talk about what uh, we're going through and how you know, and strategies to to get through it, what to say, what not to say, and um, just, you know, just know that there's, we're in good company and people go through this and it's just such a, a privilege to go through it all with this this group, especially. So I can't thank you enough. And I just, I feel this privilege, grateful. <laughs> Anders, you know, what struck me is that uh, in your in your performance piece, there's futures kind of re-experience connection, uh, memorialization, for example, but the burial blanket uh, is something to be used, mm -hmm. you know, and I wondered if you could speak to that a little bit. Thank you. I'm, I guess there's one uh, small thing I do want to say about the performance piece and the future tying back into what everyone else has shared about caretaking. Um, you know, I worked with, with you and Christina to make sure that there would be a reception after the performance, because like Brianna talked about, I didn't want to load people down with all these very heavy things and just send them off to their cars. Um, and at the reception, I also connected with um, some harm reduction resources in Chicago to make sure that there was Narcan and um, fentanyl test strips available for anyone to take uh, when they went to get their cookies and their wine or their water. Um, Narcan is a, a, dr a drug that any person can learn to administer to reverse the effects of an, uh, an overdose on an opioid. And I think a lot about the future of this work. You know, we are still in the midst of an opioid crisis and an opioid epidemic. And we are also in the midst of like a growing pretty genocidal attack on transgender and queer people. Um, and a lot of the work is about the uh, untimely death that we face um, because of homophobic and transphobic society. And so I think about caretaking with this work being about like preventing against a future. Um, so caretaking against uh, threats to the body and to the life, um, which is really interesting to think about contrasting with the burial blankets because burial blankets, you know, is this project that I started um, I'm in my second year now, um, hand weaving uh, custom commissioned cloths for people meant for green burial. So using biodegradable materials, um, sizing it so that it could cover or wrap the body according to how someone um, plans to be buried. But in the meantime, it is very much about life. And it is very much about caring for your body, caring for yourself as you contemplate your mortality. And really, I mean, pardon the pun, but softening our relationship to mortality is kind of the artist statement about what these cloth, these blankets are meant for, for enjoyment and reflection and spiritual practice during life. Um, and similar to the narrative piece, the audio piece in my, in my piece 4G, you know, which uses a lot of cyclical, nonlinear narrative structure, 
there's something about living with your own burial cloth that really sort of swirls and screws time in a way. Um, you know, those of us in this show certainly, and a lot of a lot of people in different communities around the world for various reasons. You know, we live very much with the presence of death. Uh, we live with our deceased. We live with our dead. We also live with the threat of death. We contemplate these things, and it's a way of holding the future in the present in a way that also makes you some for a lot of us as we focus more on the future and the final end of death we have a heightened sensory and emotional experience of the present moment and the material right in front of us right now um, and that's something that a lot of us have talked about in our grieving process is is in addition to the mourning and the bereavement and the shock and the pain there's like you come alive in a way and you can be flooded and overwhelmed with experiences of like gratitude. Um, and so in that way, burial blankets, it, it is fair. It is as much about the present moment as it is about the future, but we only get to have that experience of the present moment. If we do make time in the, in this very soft, caring way to think about that future. That's so wonderfully said. <laughs> Thank you. I wonder, you know, I, something that struck me about um, also the blanket was that the owner of the blanket has a sense of control. Which I mean, it, it it's a different it's a it's a different connection, but in a way, it's a it, it's having control over your own death or how you're going to be commemorated that it's not something that somebody else has to decide on the spur of the moment for you, but that it's some, because you have the blanket in your possession, you know, you can leave instructions, you can tell someone it's already partial, it's already been, it's one step towards that process. And I wonder, um, you know, since, since the one in, in the gallery, you know, the, the teal colored one is, is made for a friend, um, you know, have you had any kind of uh, response from your friend about about that? You know, kind of uh, what is their you know relationship to it like? Or you are you are one of a few people who have pointed that out to me that often in in death and during specifically the burial decisions, um, the family members or the loved ones who are charged with all of those affairs. Um, sometimes feel at a loss, you know, am I doing right by what this person wanted? For a lot of uh, queer and transgender people, we are maligned in death and dis dishonored um, because our wishes are either not known or disregarded. And so it can be really, really empowering for all kinds of reasons for the for the people who survived that person to know, all right, whatever else happens, we know that Phoebe wanted to be buried under this cloth and they helped weave it themselves and they designed it. Person that is for is a friend of mine who is also a weaver, um, and so they had a hand, literally a hand, in creating this cloth. Um, and it's very, very empowering for people to have that experience. You know, to be honest, as I said, I'm in the second year of doing this. I don't, I don't think we know yet what it's going to be like for people. I think everyone I've woven for so far um, has expressed a kind of awe and. Um, excitement about the cloth um, and it's still pretty fresh. And one thing that I'm um, really excited about myself as the artist is how does this relationship with this cloth change over time? Uh, you know, are there going to be maybe periods of your life where you don't actually want to see your burial shroud hanging on the wall every day? Maybe it gets rolled up and put in a closet. The project of burial blankets is as much about those relationships over time between me and the other people. Um, as it is about the them and the cloth. Um, but, you know, and as, as Brianna can attest to, I'm sure as well, you know, people who are planning for green burial um, are, are um, I mean, you know, everyone could benefit from a little pre-planning, um, but if you want a green burial, you're going to need a little extra pre-planning. You're going to need a few more, a uh, little bit more hand-holding for your loved ones to make sure that that can happen because it is this emerging uh 
it's the it's a reemergence of an ancient thing that has unfortunately been off the radar for several generations. It is very old. It is the oldest form of burial, but um, there's a lot of education that needs to happen now. Um, and I think that people having these this burial cloth in their lives is a great way for their family members to know. All right, yeah, we we know for sure that this is what you want. <laughs> Anders, did you start making, did someone ask you to make the cloth? And that's what you said, you've been doing it for two years. So what prompted uh, you to make, make them? Well, the first one I wove is actually the cloth that's in the 4G piece, that long piece. And that was created for a performance piece, but it was also created in the style of a burial shroud. Mm -hmm. um, and that was made for someone who had since passed. Um, and then, you know, I gra finished graduate school and the pandemic hit and I stopped making work entirely for a year and was just bearing witness as an artistic first responder, bearing witness and just absorbing the impact of this mass death event. And I got to the end of 2020 and I, and I needed to do something with my hands again. And so I connected with a friend to work at her loom for a bit. Um, and, you know, I had gotten, I had come to weaving because I knew I wanted to work with death. I knew I wanted to work with burial and burial art. And I wanted to work with it in a way that was contemporary and and in line with my own heritage and my own traditions. Um, and so that's how I started weaving cloth. And it just took, you know, these things move like this, you know, like Abdi said, like you have five things and then they come together and they all just came together at the end of 2020. And I, I said to some friends, like, should I start weaving green burial shrouds? And it was just such a natural fit with the rest of my work that my friends were like, it feels like you already do that. <laughs> So that's that's really how it started. And then in 2021, I started the business. That's wonderful. Do you have competitors? No. I'm asking a kind of tongue in cheek. You I know, would think I, I would love I would think of them as colleagues. Yeah, and yeah. I'm really struggling <laughs> to find my colleagues. <laughs> this has been wonderful. I would really want to finish off kind of lastly what's for everybody Where are your practices going and how is maybe you know grief and loss is that still part of it or do you do you have a sense of where it's moving forward or how I realize these are kind of big questions but um you know maybe it's something you've thought about or you're just working on something now I have actually uh, in 2019, when my dad passed away, I was in a documentary photography workshop. And I came out of this workshop with a book about my mom's death. And it was dedicated to my dad, who then passed away before I could show him the book. Um, and since he passed, of course, I stopped working on that book because it still needed a lot of work. And um, uh, Roland Barthes has this book, When His Mom Died, Morning Diary where he it's really just like him taking like it's like one sentence two sentences per page and in his like in in the same way I had like a notebook and I would just sometimes the pain from my dad's death was so strong I feel like I felt like I was gonna explode and it's like not even crying or screaming help so I would just write something right and this this act of writing is like whatever would help so then I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to do the same thing. So it's like a morning diary. So whenever I have a thought, you know, I write it down. So, you know, for now, these two things exist. And I hope that soon I can uh, turn both into a book. So my mom's book was called Milk Tea because she loved milk tea. And she actually wanted us to serve milk tea at her funeral, which is something that I talk about in the book. And of course we didn't because it's a lot of work. Uh, but my dad loved black coffee. And I think that now I would love to, you know, at some point get my shit together and um, have like those two books produced as milk tea and black coffee uh, together about their death in this way kind of. I guess for for now, okay, round up this chapter, having said that, and I, I feel like everyone would probably be on the same page. I don't think this experience leaves you. I don't think you can just divorce yourself from it and be like, okay, now I'm just going to make work about the trees. I don't know. I think it's just a way, you know, you, you will be this, it just becomes part of you. And again, as an artist and seeing so much resistance in how people don't want to talk and acknowledge and sit with their own mortality like everyone was talking about and death it makes you even more inclined to be like okay but i need to like put it in there so i can't imagine this 
not being part of my work, but also I know like I, my mom passed away at this point 18 years ago. So I know that grief does change and it does get milder and it does leave you. And, you know, it's like a little, little light that of pain that stays with you. So I, I have no idea how this will change. But yeah, I, I believe that it's just going to be there always. I think for me, it made me realize, you know, like Nirmal was talking about what's left behind, both my sister and my mother, I was trying to collect all of their pictures and their letters and things for my sister's sons so they could have them and what, you know, what she did with her life, like, you know, an archive, you know, for the family, because in our society, it tends to be men that are archived because they're usually running large companies or they're in the news or whatever. And it's the women whose lives that are never really archived. There, there isn't a place either in the home or in inst institutions in terms of what did they do with their life? You know, and it may be only inspirational to their children and their grandchildren in the future, but it actually may also be inspirational to other women living in that area, the state, whatever. And so I thought a lot about how do I archive? How do I honor both my mom and my sister with an adequate, adequate archive of who they were? Because I have 17 boxes sitting in my dining room of their life. And I don't want to just throw it away or I, I want to make sure that I honor them in that correct way. And I just don't know what that way is. So that's going to be my journey forward is trying to figure that out and, and encourage other women to put together something in their home because chances are your husband doesn't know everything you did when you were younger you know and there may be people who have passed away who could fill in those blanks but don't assume that they know everything don't assume they know everything about your life don't assume they they know all those things that you need to have something or some place to put your history in so those going forward know about you I don't know whether anybody else experienced this, but for me, it was hard to make work about anything else for a long time. I just didn't know where to go next, even though I felt like, you know, the the peach colored painting that the show ends with that came out of nowhere. And that was my first clue to say, hey, you can think about other things because it was a little bit more of a cheerful. It just was very intuitive work. But at the same time, I didn't know where. Um, it, when I looked at unfinished projects before my dad passed, I just simply get my couldn't go to that place and pick up where I left off. Um, so it had to be something that would be the next step after this. But I couldn't quite figure out where to. So right now I'm doing a lot of reading about voids and about um, primary shapes and meditation diagrams and things like that because meditation has become a place to find some peace for me. So I'm looking at minimalist drawings, color theory, uh, ephemeral artwork because we are all so ephemeral and um, losing a loved one really brings that fact to the forefront is like how short this life is. And also that's exactly in paradox what makes it so beautiful is that short-lived nature. So these are some thoughts that I'm still reading about and making drawings, um, but nothing that I would say if this is what I'm doing because I'm still kind of discovering what next. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I feel in the in the thick of how far I can go with exploring death in my work. I have uh, several different series, and they all have a slightly different focus, but they're all concurrent ongoing because of the nature of how grief changes, and because of how much I learn along the way about my own grief and about how other people grieve and about how the world manages all the things related to death. So 
I have a series that is about my very, very personal emotions in grief. And that was the first series, but I just made a new video for it like a couple of weeks ago because I was, I experienced something new in my grief. So I added to it the, the graves and the urns and the, and the other burial vessels, I feel are much more broad in terms of how do we culturally um, deal with mourning and commemoration. And so the series kind of go on this arc between the two, between the very, very personal and this broader cultural. And every day, I feel like I learn something new about where those things can go and what they mean. And so even though it's been, you know, in terms of the point of, of my most significant loss and the, it, it's been several years, but I feel like I'm just starting to figure out a lot of what it meant at the time and what it means now and honoring the ways that it will continue to change and incorporating that into the work as I go. Mm -hmm. Rihanna, what kind of feedback have you had from participants in your in your workshops? You know, that have gone through kind of the grief processing, making work? It really ranges. I've had some people who very particularly had not felt like they had a safe space to explore their own grief. Um, have, you know, a lot of what, in my opinion, really, really good emotions come up in terms of like, they were able to release something. Um, and so there's there's this moment of kind of like shared understanding that I get from the, that type of participant. Um, but there's others who, you know, they don't have a deeper connection in terms of like losing someone close to them, but they know someone who does. And so then they'll give this feedback of like, oh, I feel like I, I learned something about you know, how to support someone that I'm close to or learned about how I can be maybe more prepared in the future when this does happen um, to me. I've had some people say, you know, oh, it's it's so interesting to see it, this tangibly out here because you asked me beforehand, I would have said, I have no idea how to, <laughs> how to express this. But now that I've seen these examples, I, I can say, oh yeah, that's how I would do that, say that, express that if if I were in X, Y, Z shoes in terms of whatever example they're given. So a lot of it is like this kind of almost like aha moment, of whether it's someone having the time and space to express their own grief or someone learning how to be, you know, a better supporter um, or someone just maybe seeing a new facet that they hadn't seen before. I'm sure they're very lucky. Anders, what's next for you? Um, more burial blankets. Um, wa uh, watching this project unfold, watching the relationships grow, and um, and working with new people who come my way, really moving at the at the natural pace of this as a very social and emotional project as much as it's a craft-based artistic business. And that feels really good. It feels really good to be working without urgency, especially as an artist under capitalism, especially as an artist working with death when, and burial in particular, when suddenly things feel really urgent. Mm -hmm. And this is a place where it's not urgent. It's like, I've, I've got commissions I'm working on with people in the background where we've talked once or twice and they're cooking on what they want and they could get back to me in a month. They could get back to me in five years. And we'll just, we just go at that pace, whatever the pace is. So that feels really good. So that's my future. Closing comments. I just really, really want to thank um, Nirmal and for inviting me to be part of this and um, having a vision for my work as part of a contemporary arts um, exhibit and Linda for your work on the curation. And, and also to, to you guys, Christina and Adrian at the, at the museum, like I have never had such a 
lovely experience of installing a show as when I walked into UIMA that day and everyone was just so warm and friendly and loving and we could we could go we go real heavy and dark and then a minute later it's like oh do you need pizza I'm gonna get pizza it was so fluid and natural and human um and I think it's I think it's a real credit to the women who have spearheaded this exhibit that um that we were able to have that experience so thank you thank, thank you, you. It's been a well, pleasure having all of you as well. Thank you. I just wanted to say that I'm grateful for our practices because I don't know what I would have done if I didn't have my studio as a place to grieve and to, to cope because I really, really don't have any, any other skills to deal with this. <laughs> you know, it's just um, amazing that we we are gifted with something like this to bring forth beauty uh, through the pain. Um, so I'm grateful for that, but also to have a venue such as the Ukrainian Institute of Modern Art. Thank you so much for um, the inaugural exhibition. <laughs> um, it's such a lovely venue. It's been a joy working with you. Thank you. And I'll just echo that too, because it really was your vision to see how our work can also, especially um, given what's going on in Ukraine and your clientele that comes in, you know, helping them process uh, through what they're feeling and also feeling it either at home because they know loved ones or from far away. And I, I noticed that at the opening, there were a few people that literally broke down crying and I could tell it was because they had these emotions that they, they needed to let out. And so thank you for having that vision in our work mm -hmm. to provide that for them. And thank you, Linda, for your curation, the exhibition design and everything. It just looks wonderful. Thank yeah. you. A lot of people have come through and commented on it. It was. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Christina, too. You've been awesome. <laughs> yeah. It's my pleasure. You guys make my job very easy. <laughs> yeah. And the exhibition travels to the Arts and Literature Lab in Madison this summer and then to the St. Catherine's uh, University in St. Paul in uh, November. Um, the show will be different, the works will be different, who's curating is different, so it, it's interesting how to see how this show will morph and change um, through these venues too. Will you be able to share those dates with us when you get them all solidified <clears throat> and we can share those as well because I'm sure we will, I think you have a large fan base and people will want to know and right. visit if they can. Of course, you are, for sure. Thank you, Christina. Absolutely. Thank you so much, everyone.